So uh, let's uh, say a little bit about what I'm calling the co-evolutionary turn uh, in linguistics. And we can go back to the great um, Wilhelm von Humboldt, um, who pointed out that you can see language both as, as a product and ergon and, and as a process and energia. And I think just as in evolutionary biology, we're seeing a shift in the focus of what we generalize about. I think the generative um, half century focused very much on language as, as a product uh, with rules, with representations. Uh, there being this somewhat fictitious language mm -hmm. organ uh, and essentialized concepts like language and syllable and, and so on. And uh, I think we're moving more to a uh, focus on, on process, uh, selection of various sorts, co-adaptation of various sorts. I'll mention some today. So once we do that, that really upgrades the role that language diversity Place, as we heard, moves it from a, a bit part, which I think it, it has been in the generative era, to truly a central centre stage, uh, just in the same way that diversity is, is really at the core of um, evolutionary biology from, from Darwin on. And it means we need to look at all the possible design solutions found across the world's languages and have a single account, it's not that we're not seeking uh, generalizations, but what the generalizations <laughs> hold at is at the level of processes which engender complex systems. And we have to deal with a very large and competing set of, of selectors, which is what generates the diversity. They can be cognitive, they can be physical, having, having to do with a um, speech apparatus, they can be information systemic, they can be cultural, they can be demographic, they can be historical. Now we know that among the world's six, seven, eight thousand languages, many are exceptionally fragile. Here are three which I've worked on, all of which are down to their, well, last couple of speakers in the case of Dalabon. One speaker in the case of this language, Dre, which we didn't even know about until a couple of years ago, and he, he sort of walked out from his village in Papua New Guinea and was keen to have people start uh, documenting his language. He's about 70 and he walked for three days so that we could start working on his language. And then over here, Charlie Waraga, who was the last speaker of Ilgar and Manangari and one of the last speakers of several other languages, and unfortunately, took a lot of that knowledge with him when he died in 2003. So this lends a huge urgency to a task. Once we look at uh, these languages, many of them exhibit strange uh, characteristics. And as again, as in biology, it's the unusual cases which are often very informative. They're the ones in the, the long tail, as uh, Benedict Mandelbrot christened it. And if, if we step out of linguistics for a moment into the world of sex, uh, in this case, how many sexes do you need? We know that there's plenty of species with a single sex. There's a huge majority with two, but every now and then we come across species which have three or possibly more. So this particular interesting uh, species where you have queens and then you, it seems that there's two males. Uh, which are actually uh, different species, one producing future queens and another producing uh, future workers. So it's, it's an interesting case that you can read about here. Um, what's the equivalent? Well, linguists get turned on by this, not everyone else, but let's talk about tense. So um, if we look across the language of the world, we know it's very common to mark tense aspect mood and we tend to assume that it will be marked on verbs if we do it in the inflectional morphology. <coughs> and Kyle here are uh, two speakers here who I had the good fortune to be taught by. Uh, this was the sort of episode which we heard about at, at the beginning uh, from Gerhard, um, both now unfortunately deceased. Uh, but in Kyle you can see that the verb, so kurijara in past tense, kuriju in the future tense, 
does indeed mark tense on the verb, but if you look at the suffixes on the object noun, so bangana, turtle, this is bangawu, turtle, the first one is if I saw the turtle, ngarakurijara bangana, the second one, I will see the turtle. So ngarakuriju bangawu. So you're actually marking tense in two places, not just one. And if you think that what you're doing is locating a whole proposition in time, not just the verb, then why not mark it in, in principle all of the elements of that proposition. So here, if, if you go and look at Wales, a magnificent um, world atlas of linguistic structures, and look at what happens with case, you see that there are only two languages in the world that also mark tense aspect and mood in case. So it's rather rare. There's probably a few others. Uh, so then this raises interesting questions. How could that arise? Why do we do it? Uh, and, and so on. And indeed, uh, there have been published claims <coughs> by, by Pinker and Bloom in the early 90s that no language would mark tense on nouns. And that's one of those sort of confident universals about language, which turns out, um, well, to be statistically uh, a rough guide, but not to be absolutely true. So if we now go out looking for diversity, where have we looked? Where, where has the science of linguistics looked? Well, this is a representation of the, the world's geography. Uh, we're taking as a proxy the number of language learning studies uh, for which we have information in child. So I've just blown up uh, the sort of main country that languages have originated from, so you can see the usual culprits. English, French, and Spanish. I'm sorry that German's a little small there. And Japanese is being Hebrew and a couple of other languages. And then this vast world of Asia Pacific languages doesn't get much representation at all. So if we want to know how people learn languages from that area, we don't know very much really. Um, on the other hand, if we scale the world according to where the languages are, that's what it looks like. Here's this world Weltmeister, um, Papua New Guinea and Indonesia sort of coming in at number three, two and India and Nigeria and Cameroon and Ethiopia and so on uh, right up there. So there are a whole realms of diversity there about which we know very little and they have, have a great deal to, to teach us. Now under this title of co-evolutionary linguistics I want to go through four uh, levels of interaction that we get. And many of you will know this uh, very interesting woodcut or uh, an engraving that was made in 1867. Because here we have what was then a known orchid, this Angraecum sesquipedale, uh, with an incredibly long nectary, nearly a foot long. Just this little deep thing with a nectar at the bottom. That had been reported, and Darwin saw a copy of this in 1862 and wondered how it could be fertilised, because all the pollen was sitting at the bottom of the nectar, and postulated that there could, must be some moth with a long enough proboscis to suck out the nectar from the bottom. Um, but of course there were already you know, creationists uh, in those times, and people, uh, you know, Advocates of Intelligent Design, the 8th Duke of Argyll published a book in 1867 called The Reign of Law. <laughs> and the same year, Alfred Wallace replied with a paper called Creation by Law, and he seems to have um, commissioned this picture by, uh, of a moth, which at that time had not been seen. So this is an example of predictive biology, um, and it wasn't seen until 1907. Uh, when it was discovered, and some people wanted to call it Wallace's hawk moth to go with Darwin's orchid, which would have been very nice, but uh, sadly the pedants prevailed, and because it's just a subspecies, it didn't get a name like that. And the moth itself wasn't caught in the act of pollinating until 1992, so that shows how long it can take. I mean, it's probably as hard as watching some of these um, antics of chimpanzees. So turning to uh, some of the types of evolution, co-evolution we have, if we look at biology and culture, we know that uh, 
we've got the hardware of the human brain, which, as we just heard, um, has been pushed to, to grow by the needs of what it has to do. I think if you just think about the hardware and the software of computers, mouses, screens, Bluetooth, and, and everything else, and the software which underlies them, that's a fairly good metaphor for what's happened between the brain and, and the mouth and the tongue and everything else that it is to an extent, and uh, the software it has to run, cultural software of speech in the last two or possibly more uh, 100,000 years. Uh, so this has been a, a biological cultural coevolution of a particular sort. And at any point, language needs to be learnable. It has to be able to run on that system. So all sorts of innovations are constantly being made, but the ones which are just too hard for humans to learn or process get filtered out, which can funnel the set of design solutions in a particular way that creates this, uh, the big head of our uh, long tail leather ones, which are really uh, supremely learnable and which one may mistake for uh, language universals. Then, as we, we know, language leads this double life. It has to <coughs> exist in, in a brain of, of an individual, and those three people I showed you earlier, like, for example, Charlie Wadaga, uh, at that point in his life, maybe five years before he died, the whole Ilgo language was in his brain. Nowhere else uh, can exist in a single brain. But, of course, that's not what usually is the case. It exists out there among people who don't have exactly the same models. We're not like a whole lot of John Malkoviches, uh, except in this sort of idealised speaker hearer in a homogeneous speaker environment, but we're in a much more diverse set with stochastically compatible uh, representations jostling each other. And this leads us on to a lot of questions about social dynamics. For example, does language change differently in bilingual settings? Um, and once we get to that point, as early humans, uh, maybe before that, uh, the fact that we get these individual differences itself opens up opportunities for social semiotic system, maybe accents, maybe um, individuals. And for example, fine grain signaling of group membership by vowel quality, which people tend to take as a universal. I don't think it is personally, because in the Australian languages I've worked on, vowels don't actually ever seem to fulfil that function, but it's an interesting question. It was long a taboo to think that there were any genetic differences between groups of speakers. Um, going back to Boas, linguists were sort of taught you, you can plonk someone from any speech community, take a Zulu and grow them up in Beijing and they will grow up speaking uh, Mandarin indistinguishably from their ethnically racially Chinese uh, neighbours and friends. But since the groundbreaking paper by Debbie and Lab, we know that that may not be quite true. That is, uh, there do seem to be these very subtle uh, genetic differences at population level. That doesn't mean you're not going to learn a tone language if you're from another population, but it might just take you a little while longer to learn it. Would we know if it took a week longer on average, or two weeks longer. We actually don't have the statistics on that. But if we run uh, selection for uh, structures over a few hundred generations, a very, very weak genetic bias can load uh, two quite different pathways of evolution towards different linguistic systems. So uh, this brings us to some sampling problems in human linguistic history. We the languages I showed you before as being overrepresented are all languages spoken by hundreds of millions of people. That has shaped our nature, our, our ideas of what a human language is like and what a human language situation is like. <coughs> uh, but for 99% of our evolutionary history, we've been hunter-gatherers in small groups and probably highly multilingual small groups in the average case. Because if your group size is 70, you better not always seek your mate inside that group. So better to look outside. And 70 is a perfectly respectable size for a stable uh, language 
So if, if you look at areas uh, like Northern Australia or Papua New Guinea or whatever, it's quite normal to have multilingualism across a small scale mosaic like that. And it's entirely possible that particular structures like the kind of structure I sh showed you, outliers in the design space arise more readily in small populations that we, it's starting to look like morphological complexity is greater in small languages. Rates of change is an interesting problem. We need to break that down into rates of loss and rates of gain. And processes of change might be different. So we are starting to come across evidence that people deliberately push language change in a particular direction to differentiate themselves from their neighbours in small scale settings where signalling group membership is a very, very important part of our language function. So a third type of co-evolution is culture language co-evolution. I call these Humboldt Herder effects to distinguish them from superior uh, or superior wolf um, effects. So this is where cultural design choices, cultural preoccupations actually become selectors for language structures. So we, we were hearing about um, other minds and different cultures have different beliefs about the opacity of, of other minds. How far can you actually know what um, other people are thinking? Quite a lot of anthropologists have claimed that some cultures are much more epistemologically sceptical about others uh, <coughs> than, say, mainstream uh, psychoanalysts couch culture uh, that we, we all have inflicted upon us. So let's look at a particular phenomenon in, in Japanese that you can call private predicates. In English, if I say, I'm lonely, you're lonely, she's lonely, we use exactly the same expression, lonely. If we translate that into Japanese, sabshi, uh, you can only use that if you have direct subjective access to the state. So you can subjectively vouch for the loneliness. Uh, on the other hand, if I'm talking about someone else, I am a member of the audience, I have to say sabshi gateru, so gives outward signs of being lonely. She appears lonely or something. So what I did was uh, Google on the, using Google images for sabishi, and these are the images I got. So representing things from the point of view of, of the person themselves. And when I <coughs> Google sabishi gateru, this is clearly you know, someone talking about someone else's heartthrob. And here we have this famous uh, dog, Hachiko, I'm sorry, uh, who looks lonely, but it's, you can't be quite certain of its mental state, as any ethologist will know. Uh, now we can also get all sorts of interesting feedbacks between language structures, which are compatible with different types of writing system, which then may impact on society or history. So if we look at the famous stability of the Sinosphere, the fact that you can still read you know, 2,500 year old texts and this incredible uh, social cohesion through time and space uh, that is quite substantially brokered by the existence of the Chinese writing system based on, on characters. So you can write you know, old Chinese, uh, middle Chinese, but all, all of the different modern uh, variants, Korean, Japanese, Hoku or Kita, Vietnamese and so on, all with this one sign for North. And uh, it seems plausible that a monosyllabic, non-inflecting uh, language naturally lends itself to sticking with character-based representations. One of the reasons for saying that is when Korean and Japanese, which weren't of this linguistic type, have hefty inflectional morphology, uh, developed more sophisticated ways of writing their own language. Japanese especially kept the characters, but they didn't stop at that. They developed phonetically based syllable systems and in the case of Korean and, and alphabet. Uh, but with Chinese, because you maintain this uh, monosyllabic system with no inflections, uh, the character system could just remain in place. Final 
type of coevolution on a much shorter scale is between language and cognition. So here we enter the realm of Sapir Morphian effects, and many of you will know this famous case of uh, many Australian languages where the default way of referring to objects rather than saying this or that or to, to my left or to my right is to uh, locate things in absolute space, north, south, east and west. And this is a man called Jack Bumby who was videoed by two different investigators. So uh, John Haviland the first time in 1982, um, Steve Levinson the second time, um, and he's telling the same story about being in a boat, a dinghy, which was capsized by uh, a, sh a shark. And he had to then swim ashore. Now, in a language like Gobi Yimidir, not gesturing in the correct uh, absolute sense is lying. You, you have to gesture absolutely. Uh, so if you can make this out from here, the first time uh, he's saying the boat was lifted up and went like this, and the second time he said the boat went like this, because he's orienting the rotation gesture to the actual north, south, east, west uh, that dictates or you know that, that frames how he's sitting. And uh, a whole suite of studies by Steve Levinson and others has shown that uh, speaking a language like this produces very different standard cognition in the sense of how people remember spatial layouts, how they describe them, uh, and so on. So we have these, <coughs> we can call them Vika Herder effects, which are of culture on language. They're very slow, require iteration over many lifetimes. It's quite hard to get good falsifiable evidence from this. You need to look at discourse frequency, typology, comparative population studies, and then Wolfian effects, which are of language on cognition in the space of a lifetime, possibly much faster. And it's possible to study these things experimentally. Now, I want to give you two little case studies just to finish up. Uh, the first one is to illustrate the co-evolution of culture and language with respect to numeral systems, drawing on uh, some languages in southern New Guinea. So these languages are unique in the world in having senary or base six uh, numerals. And this is my uh, teacher, Jimmy Mibini, of the Nen language and his family members. And this is his yam house. And as we will see, yams are uh, where it all happens here. So if we lay out uh, some numbers uh, and count through in English or, or German, uh, conceptually they are, are parallel, we hit sweet spots where you get nice uh, monomorphemic numbers like 100 or 100 or 1,000 or 1,000 and things which are morphologically more complicated like 36 on, on the basic or 216. That's why 116. No one would think of those as sort of easy numbers. Uh, on the other hand, if you count through in Nen, you, you go Ambus, Sombus, Numbus, Ambus, Pus is six, and then you get to this nice number, Pata, which is 36, six squared, and then you keep going. If you want to say 100, it's very, very cumbersome. Sombus, Pata, Sombus, Sombus, Pus, Sombus, Sombus, which is two 36s, four sixes, and four. But then you pay off is when you hit 216, which is a horrible number in English and German, but you get taromba in, in uh, Nen, and you keep counting. I didn't do all of them. And you get to this 7,776, which is Wenemaka. So you can see that this is, you get powers of six all the way up to six, to the sixth. And these are the only languages in the world that do it. There's about a dozen. Why? Where's the six? Well, you can't say one, two, three, four, five, six. That's one explanation. Six ways out of the palm. Or some people say that there was an ancestor who lost a finger. One, <laughs> two, three, four, five, six. Uh, but there's probably a different reason to that. Unfortunately, Nen speakers don't practice the yam counting ritual anymore. They've been thoroughly uh, Christianized. But 100 kilometers to the west is another language called Kamso from the same group. And my PhD student, Christian Duda, uh, 
worked with uh, David Abia and others to record this <coughs> ritual, and I'll show you a little video footage from this in a moment. So what happens is when you count out yams, uh, it's, this is the measure of your worth as a human being. Can you feed your family? Uh, what you need to have in your yam house from one year to the next is one damano, that is uh, six to the power four, uh, 1,296 yams uh, as a reasonable person. Then if you want to have a feast, you start powering up from that. So six houses together should have a werimaka of yams and, and so on. Uh, now, at the end of each year, there's this sort of competitive tally of uh, yams. It's like the tax return, except you boast about your income rather than keeping them quiet. Um, and everyone watches. Uh, drums are beaten. And you hear uh, what happens, which I'll show you in a second. I'll just jump out. So what happens is that two men each, each pick up three yams, like a waiter, waiter carrying three cappuccinos. So one in each hand and a third balanced between them. You see, notice the third one pile up. So that's one, means one pile of six. Two piles of six, three sixes, four sixes, five sixes. Okay, that's the first count, six sixes. Huh? Now see he pulls out a little counter yam and that starts the count of the powers. And, well, I'm not going to show you the whole film, it goes on for quite a while. <laughs> you would see that gradually grow, and, and uh, on it goes from there. Right? So it's, it's not hard to see how that will then generate this um, base six and its powers. And what I'm going to spare you, but I'll just tell you, is that um, you can see this just as a... Uh, system for counting yams uh, because maybe you just shouted out in the yam counting ritual but young speakers or at least young speakers who are very consciously belonging to their ethnic group are moving away from using English numerals to count their age so instead of saying I was 30 36 yig where yig means years uh, they would say I was put up yig so they're consciously extending the basic system when they use NEN, even though their English is, is impeccable. And the older speakers who barely speak English will use the English numbers, like, like 36, because they're actually less concerned with differentiating their NEN identity or the Kamsu identity from um, the English-speaking one. Okay. Now I want to give you a second example of co-evolution, and this time it's of a particular medium, so <coughs> speech versus, uh, let's say, hand sign, uh, or sign, and a particular construction that is reciprocal constructions for saying John and Mary kissed each other, or Johannes and Maria kissed Mainan, or kissed Zee. Now, this is a really hard meaning for languages to code because you simultaneously need to express two propositions at once, John kissing Mary and Mary kissing John. Now, you can act it out very easily, um, but actually expressing the two propositions simultaneously, unless you're lucky enough to have two mouths, which few humans have, is quite uh, difficult. Now, it, we know f both from evolutionary biology and from field of engineering design that 
the number and complexity of the tasks that you have to f perform uh, increases the number of equally efficient designs. If you just have to do one thing, it's easy to converge on your design. When you have to juggle a lot, there's much uh, more diversity in the way of solutions. Now, John Heyman wrote a very interesting uh, discussion of how reciprocals are done in his grammar of Hua, which is a Highlands Papua language. And he points out that if he was very interested in iconicity, that is the isomorphism between meaning and form in language. And he said if you really wanted to represent reciprocals iconically, you'd have a structure like this, where you've got S1 and S2 both being spoken at once. Maybe Jonathan and I could talk at once and we each say the same thing. But unfortunately, spoken language isn't very good at that. In fact, it just doesn't work. You have to put things together horizontally. In Hua, however, there's a little chink which it can be exploited to evolve um, reciprocal constructions. So they have these cool things which aren't really found in uh, European languages called anticipatory medial forms of, of verbs. So this, think of this as a little bit like a participle or something, but it's also giving the information about the subject and the object and telling you who the subject of the next clause is going to be. So this word tegegaka means he looking at you and then you wait for the next sentence, right? Kind of, you looked at him. So this is how you would say he looked at you and you looked at him. And the karma would mean you looking at him and then he coming right up and then again he looked at you. So these are just normal sequences of chain verbs, each one anticipating the subject of the next clause uh, to show how this, the basic system works. So normally you always look ahead to the next clause, but just in the case of reciprocals, you turn it around. So the first verb, kogeka, anticipates the next one, he looking at you and then you, and the second verb, karana, you looking at him and then he, that anticipates, if that can be said, the one before it. So you get this sort of cycle. And then at the end you put, hey, you two did. So you manage to trick the language, as it were, into creating this um, circular uh, pattern of reference. So that's one uh, little chink which a few spoken languages have discovered as a way out of the problem. But now let's look at what happens in sign language. So we had a project looking at the semantics of reciprocal constructions across a number of languages. We had 64 video clips of various things, people hugging in different uh, configurations, punching one another, looking at each other, de-lousing each other, and we tried unsuccessfully to get three clean Dutch people to um, de-louse one another, and everyone went, who we showed this to in remote parts of the world speculated about what they were doing, caressing their hairs or whatever. Yeah. Um, so here we have some uh, of our interested participants who recognise some of these people. Um, one of the languages we got data for was Indo-Pakistani Sign Language, which is the world's largest sign language, spoken by, I think, over a million people in the, right through the, the um, South Asian uh, subcontinent. So it doesn't matter whether you come from Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, you, you use this same uh, sign language. And there's an increasing amount of information about it. So if you get people to uh, describe using in a Pakistani sign language how reciprocals work, uh, this is the commonest pattern you get. And it's something you can't really do in speech. So here's how you would say punch, pretty clear. Uh, here's how you say fight. So you have a symmetrical sign. Uh, here's how you say so look at, and here's how you say look at each other. So you have a symmetrical sign like that. Okay, so you, you can directly show symmetry in a way that we can't do in speech. So that's the first finding. The second is that when you think about what people do with each other in English, and I think it's the same in, in German, it's not quite as clear because it can be reflexive as well. Um, there are all sorts of things which aren't strict reciprocals. If you're talking about a graduation and you say, 
The students followed each other onto stage. <coughs> the guy in front is not um, following anyone. And the person at the back is not being followed. Uh, and at least some speakers, including me, could say something like, uh, the woman and the burglar chased each other down the street. Now, some people reject it and say that's illogical, but actually about 50% of English speakers you ask say things like that and say, yeah, that's all right. But no language, no spoken language that we found had a special way of encoding those. They just take the reciprocal and they sort of push it a bit to use these situations. However, in Indo-Pakistani sign language, you can use special methods for encoding this. So you just do something like this for following each other because you move through a spatial trajectory, the one after the other. <coughs> so the actual medium of, of sign ends up having consequences for what the semantic packaging into grammatical constructions is. And if we look at our, the total set of 20 languages that we had in our sample, may sound like a small sample, but it was a lot of work to get uh, so much data for each language, um, you can see that the Indo-Pakistani sign language is very much up in one corner, and that uh, largely reflects the, the different way it cuts up the semantic space across those 64 uh, video clips that we looked at. So just to close, um, co-evolutionary approaches shift the focus to variation and diversity. It's no longer the noise, it's the signal. Uh, we need to fully sample the design space because that long tail that's out there, you know, gives a lot of clues that can help us understand better what the main uh, crowd of languages are doing. Because it shows you you don't have to do things that way. So when you get something that's a bit usual, unusual, there's, there's a reason for it. Something didn't line up. Um, and causal inference about why a language is the way it is. Uh, it's just like a causal inference in biology about you know, why uh, an organism has particular features has to draw on cross-linguistic sampling. If you just say English does this because of this uh, syntactic stru structure, that, that's just um, post hoc reasoning. Uh, that means that the representation itself no longer carries the burden of the explanation. Yes, we do need uh, general theory of representations. I've got nothing at all against that. It, it's been very important in looking at the complexity of language, but it's not the same as explanation. And we need to focus on all sorts of selectors. That, that's all part of what enables us to host uh, speech in our uh, individuals and in our um, species. So the brain, the articulatory apparatus, system properties of the communication system, but also social and cultural uh, factors. So what makes you select for a, a scenery system, basic system? Why don't we have that in English or German? Well, it's possible that it's because we didn't have a particular sort of yam counting system that uh, drove us to develop that thing. So a given culture that happens to have yams as a staple, they develop a particular uh, ceremony for counting it, and then that uh, drives the selection of one type of numeral system. And we need to accelerate our momentum in documenting the world's um, very fragile linguistic diversity, which is disappearing at a frightening <coughs> rate. But if we are to have any ambition to explain, not just to describe, um, we need to address lots of non-linguistic factors uh, as well. And we just need to develop a a general comprehensive theory of how evolutionary and co-evolutionary processes generate what we find among the world's manifold languages. Thank you.